All right, the alien question. So today on Monsterology, we're gonna look at some of the philosophy, the science of extraterrestrial life and possibly extraterrestrial intelligence. And we're gonna do some imagery that's based on both the classic images from uh, B movies, but also some fairly interesting astrobiological science too. So hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll learn some things here that uh, you didn't know before and you'll think about aliens hopefully in a new way. A lot of nonsense uh, is out there on aliens, a lot of wishful thinking, a lot of paranoia, um, a lot of fun stuff as well. But it, there was a recent piece that I read by um, a, uh, an engineer, I believe, named Mark Neal, and this was in the Risk Management Journal. And he argues that really there's about four or five possible scenarios here. And we have to think about it almost like, um, I suppose, Max Brooks was looking at zombies this way. Uh, no one really thinks that the zombie invasion is gonna happen, but if we prepare people by using zombies, then our public organization, our structures, our military, our science will be well prepared for all kinds of other threats, uh, other threats, including things like pandemics. So the alien question can be useful in this way too, but um, it's also possible that there really are aliens and they really are coming. So there's a, there's a few sort of scenarios here. One is that we're all alone in the universe. That seems unlikely given the Drake equation and astrobiology tells us, look, uh, there's, you know, our solar system is so huge, our galaxy is so huge, um, and the, basically the, the universe is so massive that it's absurd that there wouldn't be life. So there's gotta be life out there. We'll talk a little bit more about the Drake equation here later. Um, so that scenario doesn't seem likely. It's possible that there's life out there, but there's no intelligent life. Um, that is something that has to be taken seriously because life can be very simple. And on our planet alone, we had this sort of, um, essentially a kind of algae, um, prokaryotic algae for millions uh, of years, uh, billions of years in fact, before we had the rise of uh, multicellular life and eventually uh, intelligence. So that's possible. A third scenario is that um, there is intelligent life out there, but they're not more advanced than we are. In which case, our civilization and their civilization will rise, flourish, and even die out and go extinct without ever making contact with each other because the, the sort of space that has to be crossed or traveled is simply too vast. That's a quite possible uh, scenario. Another scenario is that they're out there, they're intelligent, they're more advanced, and they're coming. This is the one, of course, that really uh, activates the science fiction genre and fascinates us because they could be coming in a benign form or in a belligerent form. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit later in this, um, in this uh, video as well. And finally, um, it's possible, uh, the final scenario five is that they've already been here. Um, they've been here and gone, uh, like one might see in, in the sort of uh, film Prometheus, um, or uh, they've, they've been here and they're still here. So these are the major scenarios. I think they're a lot of fun to think about, and I want to show you how astrobiology is a very interesting application of evolution theory to other minds that you might find in other species. All right, here's the, one of the first images we're gonna do, and uh, we're gonna do a bunch of these. I do a drawing here of the greys, uh, the classic aliens, and uh, also this is a wonderful image from uh, Cuvier, the uh, naturalist, uh, and sort of a fun drawing by, based on H.G. Wells' uh, time machine, the Morlocks and the Eloi. So this image here is based on the idea that uh, aliens are not really gonna look anything like us. There's an expectation, of course, in most uh, sci-fi that they're similar to us. They're gonna have two eyes and two arms and two legs, but they're not even gonna be quadrupeds. It's unlikely that they'll be vertebrates. They may well be look like pond scum. Or, you know, if Stanislav Lem, Solaris uh, story, uh, can be referenced here. Uh, intelligence may actually come as the size of a whole planet. We don't know what the biological or chemical substrate will be. We feel fairly confident, for example, that alien life is carbon-based, but that's just because carbon is so abundant in the universe and it seems likely 
that it will be. Um, what astrobiologists do is they try to extrapolate from what we know uh, on this planet to what might be happening on other planets, and that's always a risky venture. Um, eyes, for example, have evolved around 40 different times on Earth. So maybe it's likely that um, alien organisms will have eyes. It seems like a really adaptive thing if you're trying to get around in space and predators uh, could basically get better access to prey and prey could avoid predators by having eyes so it might be selected for on other planets too. One of the ways in which to try to figure out what aliens look like is to try to just think about physics and chemistry and think about what are the sort of biodynamics that are possible. But another way is to think, well, whatever these things are, they're going to be subject to natural selection. If they replicate, they have anything like a kind of DNA structure, then there's going to be variation, and then there's going to be natural selection where some of these traits fit better within the environment than others. And so that's a really interesting way to think about alien life. Um, it's tricky, though, because uh, evolution is such a contingent process. You know, the, the joke is if you go all the way back in time, and you have Homer Simpson end up in the Pleistocene or you know in the Cretaceous period or something and he steps on a bug then all of evolution will subsequently be different because it's such a chance set of occurrences and that contingency is something that biologist Stephen Jay Gould said was intrinsic to evolution it makes it very hard then to figure out what would aliens be like because there's so much accidental um, accident, accidental causation within of phylogenies. So here in this drawing I'm going to do kind of an old-fashioned uh, sketch on toned paper and I'm basing this on the uh, wonderful comparative anatomist George Cuvier's uh, text and the extrapolation to alien life is something that naturalists have been doing uh, for uh, hundreds of years. Cuvier was digging fossils out of the Paris Basin in the 1830s and he said uh, well, look, if we have just part of this animal, what can we derive about the, the rest of the animal? So if you have a, you know, if you find an incisor or a canine tooth, he said, you can infer from this that the thing must have been a predator. And that means you can infer something about what its jaw muscles must, must have been like. And if it was a predator, it probably was fast, which means we can figure out something about what its legs looked like. And we can piece together the organism sort of like a jigsaw based on the logic of physiology and function. And some of this can be applied to aliens too. In biology, you're always sort of reverse engineering based on the fossils that you're finding. And this was really popular during sort of romantic naturalism in the 19th century. People like uh, Cuvier, Geoffroy, Goethe in Germany, Richard Owen in England. Um, even Darwin, to a certain extent, was really interested in are there some universal archetypes that we can sort of assume existed in the past? And then, of course, people like H.G. Wells started to think, well, what about the future? What would human beings evolve into, um, you know, in hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years from now? And that's really what astrobiology is also doing. It's basically extrapolation. Extrapolate from the laws of nature as we know them, and what contingencies of history do with natural selection. And this is just an exciting way of thinking about uh, extraterrestrials through the lens of adaptation. All right, there's basically 100 billion planets in our galaxy alone, and if 20% of those are habitable, that's what I think the Drake equation and SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, that's what they developed in the 1960s, a kind of prediction about what planets are capable of producing a biosphere. If it's 20% of, of our galaxy's planets, and if you know 0.001% of those evolved life, then still 200,000 planets in our galaxy probably have life. And this is H.G. Wells here that you're looking at now, a drawing I did of the master. And he was fascinated by this issue of deep time and really like what would we as human beings evolve into as well. So here I'm doing a drawing based on his wonderful novel, The Time Machine. On the right hand side I'm drawing the Eloi, which is a sort of subspecies of human, very um, innocent, without guile. Um, and then on the left are the Morlocks, which are another subspecies of human that live under the earth and they're blind, they live like moles. Um, 
they actually evolved as super predators and they prey on the Eloi, which are, you know, our descendants down the road. And I love the way that H.G. Wells thinks about um, intelligence too. He says, look, uh, when the main character goes into the future and meets these, these two subspecies of human beings, neither one of them are very intelligent in the way we think of intelligence. And that's an important point about evolution and extraterrestrials. There's no natural selection pressure to automatically create intelligent beings. In fact, intelligence can be a kind of curse and a kind of source of self-destruction. In The Time Machine, H.G. Wells says, quote, nature never appeals to intelligence until habit and instinct are useless. There is no intelligence where there is no change and no need of change. Only those animals partake of intelligence that have to meet a huge variety of needs and dangers. And so uh, this reminds me of a wonderful story that philosopher Daniel Dennett tells of a, uh, a sea squirt barnacle. The first part of its life, it has a brain and it moves around like a fish. But then in the second half of its life, it roots itself to a rock and becomes a filter feeder, just basically eating the food that's in the ambient um, water. When it does that, it basically no longer needs its brain, so it actually digests or eats its own brain. And that's just a wonderful metaphor for thinking about, you know, uh, intelligence is just an adaptation like any other adaptation. And if it's no longer valuable, then it's basically a liability. So if we think about uh, these aliens here, these are the most famous that we know of. These are the gray aliens, sometimes called the grays. These are the archetypal aliens, sometimes called the Zeta Reticulans, uh, referring to Zeta Reticuli which is a star system in the southern constellation of Reticulum, and that's like 39 light years from Earth. Some people who are really devoted to the Greys think that that's where they're from. They got very popular in the 1960s and ever since because that's when uh, Barney and Betty Hill uh, claimed to have been abducted by creatures like this in New Hampshire in 1961. Um, that there's, you know, I think it's very unlikely, as I've tried to suggest before, that aliens will look anything like this. Uh, these are really fun, but there's no reason why, again, aliens would have two eyes, two arms, two legs. That seems entirely like a kind of projection or anthropomorphizing of alien intelligence. Some people have suggested that, you know, these are, you know, reconstructions of trauma from early life, trying to explain why they sort of uh, proliferate and why so many people suggest that aliens look like this. Others have suggested they're kind of recovered memories of our sort of early memories of caregivers or our mothers. Um, some people have just pointed out, well, they've become a kind of psychocultural meme. Uh, once they're in the sort of meme sphere, uh, as they emerged in the 60s, uh, then they take on a life of their own. And in a way, it's interesting because um, H.G. Wells also describes the Eloi a little bit like this. So it's possible that the Barney and Betty Hill are drawing on much earlier traditions too. What would human beings look like if they themselves, you know, lost all their hair or didn't need a mouth or <laughs> whatever it was. And so these ideas have been in circulation for a long time. One thing to think about then is what, what are the aliens going to be uh, interested in? Are they interested in eating us? Uh, befriending us, teaching us, are they just curious? Um, we don't really know. It's hard to believe, however, if you think about what, what's motivating uh, creatures to come all the way across the universe to visit us, it's hard to believe it would just be curiosity because the kind of thing that motivates that kind of travel and the development of technology might be more like hunger <laughs> rather than curiosity. Um, there is a wonderful sort of question about uh, you know, if these things are more sophisticated than us, then they obviously have a tremendous technology. And one of the things um, that uh, uh, Edward Gibbon argues in The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is, he says, you know, he's writing in the, basically in the 17, 1800s, the sort of development of the Enlightenment. And he says, you know, if barbarians are out there, but they're never going to be able to take over Europe again like they did sort of taking over and fighting against the Roman Empire. He argued that we're, we as Europeans, he thought, were so sophisticated that no barbarians would be able to sort of pose a real threat to our technology and our science. 
And then he made this further argument. He said, if anybody did, if barbarians were to develop the technology and science that was sophisticated enough to really take on human beings, uh, then they would actually no longer be barbarians, they would be civilized, and we would be able to talk with them and negotiate with them. So there's a kind of radical optimism claiming that if you get s so smart, you're also going to be m civilized and be able to sort of ne negotiate with people and reason with, with them. That seems to be overly optimistic to my mind. I mean, uh, I think the 20th century showed that very civilized people also engaged in horrific genocidal violence. So it's possible that, you know, if aliens come as our overlords and they're very, very smart, they might also be very, very genocidal and want to wipe us out. We just don't know. It's sort of fun to think about, you know, what does science do to, uh, do to the species that basically develops it? Does it change you and make you a better species morally? Or is it a totally amoral, technological, sort of utilitarian tool? So, all right, that's fun, and it's a good place to stop. Um, please hit the subscribe button and come back for more content, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Mm -hmm.